So hmm, a sec. All right. So have that reading tomorrow, and it's Calhoun's uh, defense of slavery. So please read through that. Go through the uh, uh, before you read it, make sure you read the person, who, the author, the title. You'll glean as much information as you can from the era and then think about historical context. What's going on in that period? You know, think about 1844. I give you a bunch of stuff that's going on. So, you know, those things would influence the reason why Calhoun had his attitude. And if you could come up with this point of view before you, you can read it or after, it's really important to think about, okay, why do they have this attitude? Also think about the audience who they're talking to. But the most important things, in fact, the two most important things about reading the documents are think about historical context, what's going on in that era, and the purpose. And the purpose is more than just a summary of the document. It's think about in terms of what they want you to believe. And don't forget, every single time you read a document, you see a political cartoon, you hear somebody, including me, don't forget they are biased. They want you to believe something. And it doesn't mean they're wrong, doesn't mean they're bad people, but they have a point that they want you to believe. And so when you read that document, you read Calhoun, there's going to be things in there that this might shock you aren't true. He might even be making things up to defend his position. And if you read it, you know what I'm talking about. But don't forget, that doesn't make it true. You reported this, he's using that as evidence to get you to believe something. That's the purpose. All right, so on that happy note, just to review, remember we finished the Mexican War, uh, Scott took Mexico City, the Battle of Chapultepec. Um, if you have any pets, I would consider renaming your pet Chapultepec or Freelinghoisen or Vitamin. I always thought Vitamin was a good name for a cat. Just throwing that out there. Next. Uh, they had to run down Santa Ana, get his wooden legs, make toothpicks. But then the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago, and that would give the United States the Mexican session in the Rio Grande. And then we acted like it wasn't a war of conquest. We would never do such thing. And that would lead to, I got to move something. U.S. paying 15 million and another 3.3 million to buy it. And so the election of 1848, the big issue was Wilmot. Remember, that's free soil in the Mexican session. And you have Old Rough and Ready and Millard Fillmore. Old Rough and Ready and Millard Fillmore. They would be, oh, did I tell you what happened to Santa Ana? You know, Santa Ana would be a dictator for a while. He would be in and out of power a few times. And eventually, by the late 1850s, would be in exile in New York City. During the Civil War, Santa Ana was this kind of eccentric character in uh, Manhattan. And he would uh, always be chewing on something when he first got there. He would not invent it, but he was chewing on the sap of a spruce tree. And if you, uh, sap of the spruce tree, kind of dry it, cook it a little bit, it comes to this kind of a thick, chewy substance and he would add like mint to it or other stuff sugar occasionally and he just kind of chew on it something to uh i guess keep himself occupied and a few people copied him or you know took that idea and began to sell it and market it as because it was kind of a gummy thing he would make chewing gum popular so thank you santa anna also one more thing about santa anna even though he was a you know, dictator and greedy and corrupt. In Mexico, he's kind of a hero because as time went on, so think about years and years later, his bad parts people would forget. And what they would rem remember is he stood up to the United States. As the U.S. got bigger and bigger relative to Mexico, more economic power, U.S. became a great military power, that... And, you, know, you could really see the difference by 1900. And to Mexico, the U.S. did whatever they wanted, including invading Mexico a few times. And so they saw Santa Ana as somebody who stood up to the, bull, to the bully in the north. 
And I just find that fascinating how that happens. And so with that, Winfield Scott, hmm. Yes, Tyler, you have your hand up. I'm sorry, I missed that. Um, I had this question yesterday, but how come the U.S. just won't buy Mexico? How could they buy? It, um, why doesn't the U.S. buy Mexico? Wouldn't it boost the economy and allow people to say so? To buy Mexico? Mm -hmm. They don't want to be. They don't want to be bought. They're an independent country. They are nationalistic, just like the United States is. They're Mexicans and proud of it. They don't want to be part of the U.S., which actually many times shocked the U.S. Remember I told you about in the War of 1812, they just assumed all the can Canadians want to be American. As it turned out, no, they, they actually don't want to be. So they might have a more, uh, uh, and it certainly doesn't mean that they would all prosper if, if, if uh, the U.S. annexed Mexico, but they would fight that. Yeah. And so with that, it is, do you have another question or does that answer it? Okay, good. So with that, so old rough and ready would run, Millard Fillmore is vice president. Their campaign plank on Wilmot was the Battle of Buena Vista. Lewis Cass and the scam of popular sovereignty, and then the Free Soilers and Martin Van Buren. The Free Soilers almost certainly gave the election to Taylor, and I told you what happened to Polk, didn't I? What happened to Polk a month after he left office? You remember that? He died. Why? Of? Was it cholera? That? Yeah, he died of cholera. Yeah. And he would not be... Where are we at here? Good. He would not be the first. He was the second president. He got, he got Colorado while he was president. Ooh, the water in Washington, D.C. Wow. So they thought they had lots of time. Also, now the issue of slavery came to a forefront when California wanted to be a free state. And so let's get to slavery in America. And this is when I talk about the issues of this a little bit of review because slavery would be as a part of every single part of the growth of the United States, from how the colonies formed, the Declaration of Independence. Heck, Jefferson wanted to blame Britain for slavery. And the Constitution, slavery was everywhere. So we have to get back to this. But this is from an anti-slavery journal, a British one, at the turn of that century. And it, um, it's showing a slave in chains. By the way, this was done in the, um, the 19th century, and Victorian prudent, uh, very um, Victorian, very, very prudish. With um, this we can idea see your PowerPoint. Was, hmm? Oh, I'm not we showing can... you. Yeah. You want to see it? Okay. Now you can see it. Yay! Are we back on? All right. So Victorian, very prudish. They don't want to show nudity. And so with that, since they don't want to show that, they always put them like a loincloth on. But one of the symbols of slavery, one of the first things they would do, these slave traders, when they were rowed out to these boats off the, the coast of various slave forts on Africa, they'd strip them naked. So they have them that way, is to, you know, they don't want to show nudity. But he's up there like this, and it says, am I not a man and a brother? So implying he deserves to be free. And you look at this, if this would be a very noble stance by the abolitionist movement, as we know in the United States. But it also shows the complexities of racism in that time, because he's looking up into motion like he's praying. He's not praying to a creator, creator, a, some divine figure. He's praying, he's begging a white person to do it, implying that only white people have the power to do it, meaning therefore only white people have power it's racist. It has an element of racism built into the anti-slavery cartoon. And we'll talk about this more. The first anti-slavery movements were incredibly racist. 
And it seems like a contradiction. You think, oh, you want equality because you want to get rid of slavery. It wasn't like that. But let's get to a couple things. Where is my mouse? So, 1619, this is what we've talked about before. The first documented slave ship arrived in a British colony that would become the U.S., Jamestown. So this is an inspection and sale of a Negro. That's from the uh, early 19th century. They might have come earlier, 1617, but we know for fact, 1619. And there were probably slaves in Spanish Florida, but we're talking about um, the, it's the British roots uh, that, of colonial America that would become the U.S. But then all this led to something we've talked about before, that massive class revolt, 1676 of Bacon's Rebellion. And that we have indentured servants, mostly British, European descent, some free people and slaves who were African-American Indians. And this rebellion barely put down by the Burgesses, and that would lead to the slave codes to drive a wedge between poor, the lower classes, basically poor people of European descent and poor people of African descent. And the slave codes, remember the most important, the fornication laws, which made slavery permanent. Um, servitude, slavery would be decided upon the condition of the mother. And so that would lead to racism. That would lead to the element of racism. And the beginnings come right there. Remember, racism is not just prejudice. Like when people say racist, what they really mean is prejudice. It worked, you know, prejudice based upon race. But racism is much more insidious. The powers of law, therefore government, and the tools of government and the enforcement of government, the economics, which is a lot of government too, and society to put one race above another, AKA white supremacy. Because that's what it will turn up out of this. Whites, they have all the rights. They must be better. And this would be pretty insidious. Because then this could be used for, okay, if whites are better. This is sex. That justifies colonizing and taking land from people who are not quite white. It's amazing how fast it happened. But one more bit. So we've talked about the triangular trade before. In fact, I showed you this picture of the Sanderson going from Rhode Island, carrying uh, mostly rum. It would also carry, ships like this would carry muskets. Arrive off the coast of Africa. Once you get south and go along the Sahara, all along the coast of Africa, there are virtually no natural harbors. Sub-Saharan Africa were not necessarily seafarers. Now, in the north on the Mediterranean, oh yeah. Great harbors, um, natural sea, um, seafarers, but not down here. And so most of the kingdoms, and some very powerful and rich, they're more in the interior. So there'd be these slave forts off the coast, or right on the coast of Africa. Some that they started like wooden stockades, but soon become very elaborate. M most still exist. And European ships, like from the Dutch East India Company or the British East India Company, or just merchants from the American colonies or the U.S., would anchor off the shore, and then they would buy slaves from these slave forts. And then this path here would be to, in this context, the Caribbean, but it could be to Brazil, and drop off the slaves to the sugar plantations, get sugar, go back up to Rhode Island, start the cycle again. Now, the reason I'm putting this up here is because this right here from Africa to the Americas will be the most horrific part of the slave trade. Everybody will talk about this. And, oh, did I tell you Polk died? I didn't tell you the story about Polk died. I did tell you, yeah. Polk died of, I forgot, I missed out. Polk died of, yeah, uh, cholera. All right, so this is gonna be called the Middle Passage. You've all probably heard of the Middle Passage. I mentioned it in class. <coughs> the first, need a drink, real anti-slavery movement would focus on, they would focus on the, uh, the Middle Passage. That's the international slave trade, where human beings are being kidnapped here by the millions and brought to the Americas. Okay, this one shows a rough estimate. You know, they did keep pretty good figures, the slave ships, 
pretty good because each slave is money. And they also had to figure out how much food they needed for the voyage. But still, it's very hard to figure out. Between 11 and 12 million human beings were removed from Africa and taken to the Americas. Back in back in around 100 AD, the Romans destroyed a rebellion in Judea, and they forced the Jewish population there, just kicked them out, removed them. And this is called the diaspora, where they would move to Africa, Europe, Jews spread throughout Europe and Northern Africa. And so this diaspora, for Jews, this is going to be called the African diaspora, the African diaspora. And just like it sounds, D-I-A-S-P-O-R-A, diaspora. But you see most of the slaves came to, went to Brazil, and then the Spanish Empire, the West Indies, that sort of thing. About 500,000 or so were shipped to the United States. And this Part of the reason why Africa is going to be so vulnerable to colonization and so unstable is because you remove 12 million people, massive hunks of the population, remove them, and this would destroy societies. If you want to know why Africa has so many problems, I just basically explained it. And so with that, this middle passage, a couple things about it. So the ships would anchor off the shores here or along Angola down here, what is now Angola, along these shores. Very few, Af uh, very few uh, Europeans, at least, um, at least until the middle of the uh, 19th century, were involved in, direct, directly involved in the slave trade. They might have had the slave forts, like, um, but they were not directly involved. The slaves were kidnapped or gathered by other African kingdoms, and most were prisoners. So there'd be a, a, um, the warring, very wealthy kingdoms, you know, on places like Timbuktu or Daria, they'd be these massive fights and prisoners would be enslaved or they'd go on slave hunting expeditions where they'd go in and capture human beings and enslave them like people right here. And then they would be sold a couple times, eventually to be slave forts along the coast. But a significant number, oh, before we get to the debtors, I should add, if you start having a, these wars for slaves, fighting and getting slaves, well, to protect yourself, you want to protect your kingdom and your village, what are you going to have to do? You're going to get your own slaves, capture them to buy, to trade them for muskets to protect you. It performs or it will make a dangerous cycle downward, a regression downward. So here are a significant number of slavers or a significant number of people being drugged by slavers. This is going to the coast and it says revenging their losses. There must have been some slaves run away like a, a rebellion, some kind of fight. And here they're butchering one to terrify the other so they don't run away. But a number, maybe as high as 50 percent of the slaves who would get to the new world were actually debtors who owed a debt and we're trying to work the debt off, much like an indentured servant. And this goes back to, heck, this practice you can see people becoming indentured servants, pay off debts. 4,000 BC, go back to ancient Sumeria, which is what present day Iraq. And they're becoming indentured servants, so they're gonna become a slave until they pay back their debt. And then they would be free. Well, they're slaves. Next thing you know, just an absolute shock and absolutely terrifying, I'll pay back, pay back my debt to get back to my family. Next thing you know, they're on a slave fort, about ready to be put on a ship and taken to who knows where. Maybe their debt, which would turn out to many of them would be, and perpetual slavery, which makes it even more terrifying than, than um, just simply a slave raiding expedition. They get to the shore, and here is one, a Dutch slave fort right here. The Dutch were big slave traders, and there was no real harbor. So they would row them out to the boats, and they would try to mix slaves from different um, villages up so they couldn't communicate, <coughs> and absolutely terrifying. You know, these aren't people who had any practice on the sea. And so it just had to be just so amazingly shocking. A significant number of slaves would die right away. I mean, just their body would just shut down. It just had to be 
so terrifying, especially if you're trying to work off debt. And next thing you know, you're going to some, well, it will appear almost alien, like an alien invasion. And then we would put on board a ship. Now, these three pictures I showed, the first thing that would happen, they'd be stripped naked. Yeah, I'd see the loincloths, but they're stripped naked. This is all an effort to dehumanize them. What makes us human? One of the things are we're closed, protect, heat to protect your body. Take that off, dehumanize them, terrify them even more, make them feel even more vulnerable and scared. So this context, they're, they're naked. Chains are bolted on them, just scary. No one's telling them anything, it's just happening. Being whipped and beaten and shoved down to these reeking halls, which had to be just beyond uh, the smell must just beyond comprehension. And chain there they are chaining these terrified people down to the halls. And here's an example from an anti-slavery journal. All of you have seen this, it's in our textbook. It's one of the most famous, it's a British anti-slavery journal and it's showing a tight packing ship. And what it would be, and you have two decks, below deck, two decks. And here is one deck where slaves are packed shoulder to shoulder, chained on their back. And then a second deck doesn't cover the whole thing because it'd be too much weight. So this would be over this first part of the slaves. And it's about three feet above it. So the chain underneath it, this is to pack as many human beings as possible. Because what happened on these slave ships, the tear of this, the um, the shock, the the mistreatment, we didn't matter how many with my mouse. It didn't matter how many slaves were on board one of these ships, how tightly packed they were, a third are going to die. And so the slaveholders, these these slave traders got to make as much money as possible. And this is one of the things you'll find out about this kind of proto-capitalism. Nobody really wanted to think how much of a, how awful this was, the slave trade, and how much everybody was indicted by this. Everybody who profited from slavery was indirectly or directly responsible for this horrible treatment on these slave ships. And when they would first get there, oh, I almost forgot. Here are a couple pictures. First off, here are the picture in the lower left-hand corner. This is a tight packing ship, but it's trying to show the upper deck and people crammed in, getting a little bit of food. And you'll notice there's babies in here and they're taking away somebody either is ill or died, just throw them overboard. If there's ill, why waste the food? They planned on these ships. They planned that they would need less food every day and they would just throw the dead bodies or sick people overboard. Sharks would follow these boats all the way across, just a feeding frenzy. And days where there's not very much wind, they might be in a sit uh, one place for a pretty long time. And these are ultra type packers. So you notice people here, the deck above is only three feet above them and they would be sitting down chained and they would pull the chain back, chain it to the wall so their knees come up to their chest as much as possible to pack as many humans as possible. With the idea being, they're gonna die anyways. They're all naked, they're all in their own filth for a day or two, then they would throw them on deck. Here's another way. You see how they're on their knees, chained their, an their ankles, chained to their wrists, ultra tie packers. Nobody wants to admit how bad it was. It's like one of those things, we just don't want to know what really happens. Then they're going to act like they're good people. Well, one of the first things they would do, and this is from an anti-slavery cartoon, so you notice how cruel the captain looks right here. They would, they knew after about four days, they keep them chained up. But after about four days, they had to clean them. They would bring them on board or bring them up to the deck and throw salt water on them, which can you imagine how bad that hurt their scars from their chains? But they also knew after three or four days when the realization hit that they're not going to be home. In fact, they get, they can no longer see land. That's when they might rebel. And so they would just, this was just the norm. They would take one person, man or woman, usually a man, here's a woman, and torture them to death in front of everybody else. 
as an example. You rebel, and we have ultimate power. I want to be clear about something about the Middle Passage. You've all heard about it. You can imagine how bad things are. I can try to explain it. It's a thousand percent worse, many times worse than I can explain or you can imagine. We can't imagine, we can't imagine how bad it is. Just can't. In, in a, we don't have that ability. Maybe we should have a little more empathy. We try. But here's a couple other pictures of it. Here are being whipped and brought on shore. They would be made to, they would throw water on them, salt water. They would be made to jump. They would like play music or something so they would move around. So they'd be healthier. Here is one. It's a pretty horrific one from the 1850s. Tortured right here. He's being beaten with a stick. Here are little bits of food. It, not cornmeal. But here, you can also see there and right here, virtually every female slave is going to be raped by the crew. That's just, just what happened. They just did it. And another one of the hells of the slave trade. But this one might be the best, most dramatic one. This is from the 1850s. And it's showing the bottom deck and all the people here chained up underneath. But then here are them dancing, moving around on top. And it shows a couple things I think are really um, interesting. First off, you see him right there? He's being tortured to death. They're dumping boiling water down his throat. They're torturing him in front of everybody. Here, you notice the nets around it? Every slave ship had nets all the way around the deck of the ship because when people realize their fate, a lot of them try to take their own lives in their own hand, take their lives in their own hands. Here's somebody jumping through a hole to commit suicide. And so this shows you how horrible this three to five week trip is going to be. Absolute hell. And this is from an anti-slavery journal this is from a true story, but this happened a lot. If they started, they miscalculated and more people survived or they had more, or they had less food than they needed for the people who survived, they would just start taking the ones they thought wouldn't make as much money, throw them overboard, just kill them. This example, this happened in 1778. When news of this came out in Britain, that would help trigger their anti-slavery movement. Here, throwing her overboard, whipping people to try to stop it. When they arrived on shore, the slaves scarred, unhealthy, and here it shows a cargo of 94 prime healthy slaves. This is from Africa. They would delay a couple days, feed them a bunch, uh, feed them fairly good food. Okay, not really good food, but fatty food. In fact, just give them pieces of fat. That would uh, make them look healthier. And here they're coming out the slave ship. And this slave ship, this is a really weird picture. You notice the guy with, that's a whip, and he's whipping them to make them dance and move around. And I think this is a good picture, showing them uh, moving around with a little kid, men and women. There's a guard dog uh, um, nipping at one. And then they would cover them with um, grease, animal fat, cover their body with animal fat, and then send them to sale. The animal fat would make them appear a little healthier, high blemishes, hide the scars from the, from the chains. And they would be poked and prodded and sold right there. Here's slaves on the parade ground of a fort, a uh, U.S. fort in Augusta, Georgia. This is before the Civil War. And so that slave trade, when people talked about how bad slavery was, the first focus was, kind of people are kind of myopic and also could see the hells of it, was that middle passage. That's why the United States could claim the moral high ground in 1808 when they banned the international slave trade. Talked about this before. See, we're not involved with this. And by diffusion, slavery would go away. And this shows that of all the Americans, eventually the number of slaves from Africa did go down. By the way, this is the whole page from that journal that everyone sees. But it didn't happen the way they thought. What happened? The Industrial Revolution. The textile mills in Britain <coughs> and then in New England, they needed cotton. Demand for cotton skyrocketed. The problem with cotton was, you see these puffs right here? The cotton, when it's ready to pick, will kind of puff out, and this cotton fiber will come out, but it's attached to a hard seed. 
And that hard seed has to be removed by hand, broken off by hand. I guess it's really sharp. Fingers just get hammered. But then that fluff of cotton then could be used. Backbreaking work requires a significant amount of labor. So what came about? The cotton gin. The cotton gin, all gin means is just machine. It's just a name for a machine. And this would revolutionize the process because this you turn this crank and add these prongs sticking out. You dump the cotton in, turn the crank, the cotton would be wrap around these prongs and start to rip off the seeds. And then it had these brushes that would turn next to it and the brush would brush it off the prongs, seeds would drop down by gravity and this cotton fluff, hard cotton fluff would come out. And once they had that, wow, because that would do the work of 10 and then even more slaves. And therefore, it could make cotton profitable. They could meet the demand. And this shows how 1820, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, only 334,000 bushels of cotton. By 1860, 4.8 million. And look at the number of slaves, 4 million slaves. We'll talk about 1860 a little bit more down the road, but Eli Whitney, who we mentioned before with uh, interchangeable parts in the American system of industry, that's his patent for the cotton gin. So he's credited for inventing it. He almost certainly did not invent it like he didn't invent interchangeable parts. He got it when he was in South Carolina and it was probably just a machine jerry-rigged by a slave. So he stole. And that met the demand for the Industrial Revolution, but then the demand for slaves skyrocketed. And if the demand for slaves skyrockets, that means the price per slave goes up. We're talking big money. Big money. So this is a couple pictures. First off, this is from a textbook. Well, let's show this one first. This is from a lithograph in the 1850s. One of those pictures they would make and they would, sometimes you see it watercolored. But here's showing Eli, Eli Whitney's shop, cotton gin. And the guy's looking at the cotton like, wow, look at all this cotton. But look at the slaves. Look at their faces. This is done on purpose. They're smiling. They're happy. They love slavery. And that's an important idea. Think about when you read Calhoun's letter, Pakenham letter. The slaves are shown to like it, to like slavery. Look at this one. The same kind of deal. Yay, we're slaves and having so much fun. And I'm saying this because this will be one of the defenses of slavery. So we're coming to this concept of King Cotton. And King Cotton would show the dominance in American trade of cotton. And once that happened, cotton became in demand, King Cotton's empire would be the black belt. This region right here, the black of rich black soil, that's the extent of the glaciers. That's where the glaciers, the furthest extent right here, the black belt, rich black soil. And so that's where the plantations were. When they said, we're gonna down river, and I've mentioned that before, this is down river. 1860, look how much land is under culti intense cotton cultivation. This picture shows it right here. Look in the yellow. That's the short fiber cotton that's now opened up to production by the cotton gin to meet the demand of the textile mills. Now, don't write or don't think that it's just the cotton gin did it. Because if they just had the cotton gin, they'd just be pushing out all this cotton fluff and have no one to buy it. It needs the Industrial Revolution. And this gets back to something very important. There might not have been really slavery in New England or Britain by 1850. But they're all profiting from slavery. They're all indicted. Let me go back one. So remember this picture right here. So this is the black belt of rich black soil. Now look at this picture. This is a pie chart showing the population. Remember, every 10 years there's a census. And they, have, they count everybody. That is in the Constitution. Citizen or not citizen, they're counted by the census. Why? Partially because, remember, slaves are, going, are not citizens, but they count as three-fifths of a person towards representation. Look at the blue gets much bigger in the black belt. 39, 33, 57, 44, 44, 40, 55. Two states, the majority of the population were enslaved. Enslaved. Anybody want to guess? what the first state was to secede from the Union. Huh, I wonder why. Second state, 
Hmm, I wonder why. And then the rest of them all came together. Black belt states. Why? The slaveholders in these states had more political power than any place else. They dominated the states. Fewer slaveholders, less political power. So they're going to do everything they can to keep their wealth, to keep their power, keep their, um, keep their position. So it's really a slave kingdom down here run by this aristocracy. And not just they have more political power and they're going to keep what they have, therefore be more um, radicalized to protect slavery. Don't forget, what is their greatest fear? The greatest fear of slave owners, slave rebellion. Where is the greatest threat of slave rebellion? Where is there's a, they're the most slaves. The, that's why these states would secede first. And so 57.5% of all American exports would be cotton by the Civil War. This is making money. This is making wealth. This graph shows all exports, but well over half, cotton. So they're making money, and it's going to the textile mills in Britain. That's why the South thought they would win the Civil War. Britain, they assumed, would never allow that cotton, the, the flow of cotton to be cut off. They assumed Britain would join forces with the Confederacy to keep that cotton going. That's what they assumed, which makes no sense because Britain was against slavery, but that's what they assumed. And so with that, we get to why there's no industry in the South. All the money in the South, the extra money, that would normally go to machines, it's all wrapped up in slaves. It's all wrapped up in land. So here's an ironworks, so a ironwork, Treadfigder ironworks in Richmond, Virginia. It's one of the few, one of the few. All the money's wrapped up there, they can't buy machines. Also, and I'll, I'll tell you another reason, that's why they're anti-tariff. Anti-tariff, they don't have industry to protect. All their money's in slavery, they don't want this tax because that will affect slavery. And if they don't want taxes because they don't want tariffs, they have no industry to protect, they don't want the things that tariffs make. That's why they're anti-internal improvements. They don't want roads. They don't want to pay for canals. They don't want to pay for railroads because that requires taxes. And so there's going to be an intense anti-tax feeling in the South. To them, any tax by government is potentially anti-slavery. Any tax by government. Last thing I'll put down for today. Because as they see it, they're anti-tax because any tax on wealth, any taxes on, taxes on wealth is anti-slavery. Because that's a tax on slaves. If they allow for tariffs, if they allow for other taxes, if they allow for property taxes, they're gonna tax slaves. So they're gonna be intensely, intensely anti-tax in the South. And that will go on to this day. And it is a legacy in so many ways of the defense to or the desire to protect slavery, the knee jerk anti slavery. We don't want schools. We don't want these things. Literacy was much higher in the North. Still is. We don't want them because it's taxes. And on that happy note, we'll finish this tomorrow. So have your Calhoun read. Please enjoy your lunch. It's a beautiful day. Actually, it's really nice. Nice blue skies. See, you're welcome. I don't want all the credit, but I want most of it. I'll see you guys tomorrow. I hopefully we'll know if we're going to be here or not. Goodbye.